So how is everyone doing? Fine? Yay. Am I seeing people nodding? It's a beautiful day, isn't it? Uh, but the beer hasn't arrived, so am I still seeing people nodding? Yeah. <laughs> so, but everyone in the UK says all the time they are fine, you know. I noticed that even if your dog pissed in your bag this morning, ruining your <laughs> brand new Mac, no insurance, you still just say fine. <laughs> still, well, actually, I, I probably better like getting my slides out. So, but still, uh, measurements published by the WHO uh, suggest that depression is now the second leading cause of life lost, and by within 12 years, uh, it will be uh, the the amount of disability and life lost as a result uh, of depression will be greater than than that uh, resulting from any other conditions, including cancer, stroke, suicide. Um, Almost like a quarter of um, NHS activities taken up by mental illness, and that's like covered by the little bit more than 10% of NHS funding, which we know that probably is just like a fraction of all the, ex the real expense of the problem uh, to the society. Also, with, if you look at how young people are feeling that uh, their happiness and com confidence level dropped to the lowest level in a decade, and more than half of them uh, experience some kind of man mental problem, but, and more than a quarter of them feel hopeless um, on a regular basis or all the time. And for me, that's quite a high number. And uh, there's a sharp increase in, in knife crime and um, a self harm and suicide attempts just over the roof. It's uh, uh, doubled or tripled for girls, actually tripled uh, within a decade, uh, the, the number of admissions into hospitals. And this is just not fine. This is just, for me as a mom, it's heartbreaking. Like, how can we let young people down like that? And, 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 and what, what are the outlooks for our country if we let this happen? But I'm here to tell you, and actually, like, I guess you came to a presentation for happiness. Not, <laughs> you would guess, but you know, and at this point, if you already decided to jump out the window, I don't think that's going to work. We are on the ground floor, so you might just <laughs> end up breaking your arm. You might need to walk up the stairs or something. But you know what, then you will just make those stats even worse, so don't do it. Not, not before the beer arrives, actually. Give, it, give that a go. So I'm here because I'm convinced that we can do better and the problem is tremendously complex. But, however, our ability to understand and break down complex problems uh, also growing by the day. We have data available now that never before to build a happier society like the World Happiness Report or the uh, uh, or the New, Eco New Economic uh, Foundation Happiness uh, uh, Happy Planet Index, um, which actually also takes into account the, the natural resources we use, so it's more environment friendly. We also have, there's also uh, emerging research fields like positive psychology. Uh, while traditional psychology is, uh, main objective is to help uh, people with, with mental problems using uh, drugs or therapies. Uh, like positive psychology is aiming to bring that average up to a higher level of happiness. So why not look at the, uh, the research outcomes and build it into architectural design? We could also measure like happiness levels of different neighborhoods and if we find like happier neighborhoods, we could maybe just learn and apply them to other neighborhoods. So there's, there's plenty of ways to kind of start uh, doing the progress. Uh, it's also predicted that by 2050, 86% of uh, the developed world will be uh, urbanized. I think that's no wonder, like cities give us a higher income, a much wider range of entertainment. You can even come to like amazing uh, meetup talks like this one, so no wonder people just not want to go to the to the countryside anymore. So, um, but, but on the other hand, um, depressive disorders uh, are more commonly observed in urban rather than in rural um, populations. So it looks like that somehow we get more lonely and in crowds. 
Um, so if we could find the root causes of this and, and the secret ingredients that we lost while we were moving to the city, and if we could kind of somehow sprinkle that ingredient back into the urban, urban areas, then I think we've got a good chance that not, not only to lower the prevalence of the illnesses, but also to make people happier in general. So I think that's a real opportunity. So can we take two seemingly kind of contradicting or conflicting concepts and, and, and somehow make it happen in, in good architectural designs? Uh, so first, I think we need to kind of understand what happiness means. Um, there's an amazing like Harvard study of adult development, which uh, is a still running life study, uh, observing people's lives as they were unfolding. Uh, started with more than 700 people, 700 men actually, at that time it was only men, <laughs> um, from all different backgrounds. And um, the study provided uh, unprecedented access to data on satisfaction and, and health-related markers. And I would like to show you uh, what, what they learned. What are the lessons that come from the tens of thousands of pages of information that we've generated on these lives? Well, the lessons aren't about wealth or fame or working harder and harder. The clearest message that we get from this 75-year study is this. Good relationships keep us happier and healthier, period. So they also, another finding that of that same study was that isolation and loneliness kills. Still in the UK, one in eight people, that's seven million people in the UK say they have not a single close friend to turn to. And also one in five people say that they, uh, within adults, they uh, feel lonely often or all the time. And the report also showed that younger people feel uh, are more likely to report that they are lonely than older people. So could we maybe then approach the problem by kind of solving or connecting people more? That's probably a good bet. So there's a type of neighborhood that is, was specifically designed for uh, connectedness and it's called a co-housing, where you've got like private homes all around with uh, in individual life, their own kitchen, everyone's living their own, own life uh, in those homes. Uh, but there's a, a big connecting outside space in the middle, what you can see, and there's usually a community house in these setups. The, so this is now how normally like an outside space and the, uh, the Kama house um, includes a large kitchen dining area, recreational spaces, gym, jacuzzi, art room, there's sometimes even a carpool. Um, neighbors gather for meals, um, parties, games, movies, barbecues. Uh, in co-housing setups it's, uh, it's very is to form clubs and organize child and elderly care. Co-housing as an urban movement um, began in, in Denmark and was inspired by an article which, which was called, like, uh, called um, Every Child uh, Should Have 100 Parents. Uh, and I quite like that. Uh, today, 50,000 uh, Danish people live in co-housing and 10% of their new developments fall into this category. Um, and they also adopted it uh, as their uh, social housing model. Uh, and the social housing movement uh, is extending. So it's now not only the Nordic countries, uh, it's now also Europe and uh, the US too, just following suit. They can come in all different uh, shapes and forms. Uh, sometimes some, some developments are quite restricted on external space, external shared space, but which is in, in the middle in this one, or in the, in the roof. But they still would have like a community uh, room with dining and kitchen areas, where uh, normally in these setups, the people usually uh, eat together like four or five times a week even. 
Uh, in the UK, it's also picking up. There's like uh, a 20 to 30 uh, uh, build uh, um, uh, co-housing uh, schemes, but it's, it's growing every day. It's 60 more in the pipeline or something. So um, even Westminster Union now started to offer a study unit uh, for the groups uh, for their groups on co-housing. Um, most um, co-housing uh, communities in the UK are mixed, but now, um, but some of them specifically for uh, people over 50s or for a special interest group like women only or LGBT. I'm often asked uh, whether co-housing can work for if complete strangers can move into, into one place. And I can tell you it does with high certainty. Why? Because I was lucky enough to be born in one. It was a new purpose-built estate near a sugar factory. You can see that in the background. And uh, there were three blocks, really pretty, aren't they? Blocks of estates uh, with uh, four, uh, 54 family, uh, family homes um, and 54 random families kind of uh, moved into this estate when the factory opened and families didn't know each other. Bigger children often looked after the smaller kids, which was quite cool because we could conduct scientific experiments uh, in fields like combustibility of materials. <laughs> On one of the very successful trying attempts uh, ended up proving that wood is combustible uh, indeed. And there was a slight financial casualty that this unused uh, timber building like burned down to ashes. Uh, you can imagine uh, parents were not too impressed when they came back, but luckily no one got hurt. We had huge outdoor areas um, which connected us. Um, we had a barbecue place, playground, multi-sport area, and even a nursery. Uh, we used uh, the factory's canteen um, as a community house. Programs like chess clubs, aerobic club, uh, movies, uh, table tennis were on the menu pretty much every, every day and every night, and all organized by the people living in this state. We kids were absolutely convinced that you can get pissed on coke, which just took the country by storm at the time. A few years later, unfortunately, uh, the factory closed down and all the people moved, moved away. Um, and um, yeah, so how do I know that uh, this, uh, this uh, setup was quite working for everyone connected people? I, I don't have like any uh, formal measurements to prove that, but I have a very strong clue. 30 years on, someone started a Facebook group and uh, within a very short period of time, 177 people uh, signed up to this group, which means like two, three people from every single household signed up to this group. That's almost every family. And now there's even a summer barbecue organized uh, uh, yearly, and so this sense of belonging is still there after 30 years. Actually, this is some prominent members of the science group, including my brother. So, um, actually, we'll go back for a second. Um, when we moved town, so I, I was eight when my family, uh, family uh, moved town, and the biggest difference as a child uh, living in a car housing setup and a detached house was this. When you look out the window uh, in a, in a co-housing, then you see other kids playing outside all the time. So you just go out and play with them. As opposed to uh, the, when we moved to the detached house, I remember staring out the window of my bedroom and the garden was empty. So was my soul. And there was no one to play with. And actually we had kids in the street, but they rarely came around to play. So, and I observed something quite similar with my kids as well. Uh, during play dates, when we have other kids in the garden, they are out all the time. But on quiet days, they just nag me for, for the laptop or, or, or sweets. So, um, you may think that co-housing could be a beautiful way of living for some of us, but it might not like 
but it will not fit everyone. And you may also point out that it's highly unlikely that we could adopt the co-housing model uh, widely in our existing cities. And I think you're absolutely right to think that because it would be naive to think that we can convert London into a co-housing paradise in a million years. It's not going to happen. However, we can take ideas from existing connecting spaces and apply them. I often talk to people uh, about connectedness in architecture. Uh, I, I discuss it probably more than they want me to. During these uh, conversations, people often give me examples of uh, uh, existing highly connecting spaces they know. And these stories I find invaluable as, as these accidents accident examples uh, could potentially hold the key ideas to replicate. So I picked out uh, three of those uh, stories for you today. And if you don't mind, I will, I will just read them up because I, um, I just want to take the quotes as, as uh, I received them. So this first one is from Rob from Twickenham. Twickenham. The Crescent, here in the middle, you see that funny shaped area. Um, is an open area of lawn with trees in front of our house. It's a cul-de-sac. Uh, cars cannot go the whole way around. You can see that it's cut off on them. Children knock on each other's door to suggest they go out and play. Parents are pretty relaxed about them being out on the green unsupervised because there's so little traffic. In the summer, I would say, our boys are out on the crescent every other day. Once a year, there's an ad hoc summer party when we have food and drinks together. The kids play until late into the night. I would say people on our ro road uh, know uh, their neighbors better than most. Uh, we are on friendly terms with at least eight families. Their older children have done babysitting for us and two of them have been professional child miders for us. Second story. So it's just like the street topology just had some quite benefit here. This is my favorite one. Selena lives in one of those 10 houses with a path in the front and she says uh, there are steps down to the house. You can see the stairs on the back there and here. From the road but it makes it feel slightly more cut off and more of a community itself. We know everyone living here. When I cannot collect my, my kids from the school, I know someone else will. We see our neighbors all the time. For example, some weekends recently, people have been gardening the little front gardens and the children uh, have all playing together. The children um, often use the scooters up and down the path. The benefits are the friends made. For example, this evening I looked after a baby, uh, uh, a little boy so his mom could go to class at her gym. Last night, we, were, uh, we went for supper to another neighbor's house, uh, and tomorrow I will meet a third neighbor in the playground next to the houses. He will just knock to let me know uh, when they go out, uh, so, and it's much easier than formal play dates. So what I really love about this example that you can see that this connecting space, it's not quite pretty, isn't it? It's, it's just a path, but it makes a massive difference in, in, in those people's lives. And probably even financially, they don't have to pay for child minding. That's cool, isn't it? The third example is quite a short one. Um, residents, I read it on the internet, so this must be true. So the residents had a party and closed off the street, and the kids and all the people were out talking. At the end of the day, an older lady, a resident, said, what a lovely event, but I have just one question. Where did you get the children from? So she had no idea that the, the kids were living in her street and he has been, she has been there all her life. She wouldn't recognize them. So children are spending their lives in their bedrooms. Professor Tanya Byron, clinical psychologist, uh, says that this plays a significant role in the health crisis. She says that we raise our children in captivity. So actually, hands up, who has cages? Who has kids? <laughs> Just a few. Have you got cages for them at home? <laughs> no? Yeah? OK, good. But you tape them, duct tape them on the, into the wall, like 
from time to time, don't you? So what this means is quite harsh to say, isn't it? Captivity. But actually, surveys show that distance that uh, children freely can walk uh, has shrunk by 86% just in two decades, and three quarters of UK children spend less time outside than prison inmates. It's actually, it's actually, it might not be too harsh to say that we raise them in captivity. So how can we get kids out again? So what I found, one common theme that I found in all the stories that I have and, 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 and all the setups that were connecting people so far, and I'm still waiting for the rule to be break, uh, that they all had some kind of shared space safe from cars at your doorstep. Um, so uh, this raises a question in me. Uh, do cars disconnect us? And, and how much happiness are we sacrificing for a car-dominated transport system? The good news about this is uh, that um, with the sharp increase in cycling and in ride-sharing and car-sharing and uh, with the introduction of new technologies like self-driving pods or um, delivery drones, uh, the number of cars parking uh, in the streets is likely to drop significantly, holding a great opportunity to form new connecting spaces. So this, for example, is a picture taken in my street just yesterday morning. It's not too many cars, but too many car lanes. So how about like maybe rethinking our kind of usual default street topology, which is just all the street is for the cars? How about like maybe, maybe cutting them into two uh, car stocks, like like this. I probably need banks on my side for these projects, but uh, or maybe this. And you know what? If we don't have too many parking cars, and, and, and we could find one way of uh, parking those cars separately, maybe in someone else's street or somewhere, <laughs> then then we could get to something like this. So, in this example, you could still occasionally access for vehicles like, like ambulance or fire engine or garbage truck, but, or you could occasionally offload your shopping um, with a restricted speed limit, but it's still much more reminding you of a connecting space for kids and families. How about like thinking of, about boundaries we set for our kids, for everyone? Do we fence ourselves too much around? So, for example, like this is quite a usual setup in, in residential areas in London. How about like removing those fences? Oh, I guess this might not happen in many setups, but how about just putting a few gates uh, with neighbors you like and they have kids? Or maybe forming like a corridor on the back of the garden um, for kids so they can just uh, use that to go into different, uh, different uh, houses. And actually that kind of corridor, I'm talking about like a back access, is usually there. I mean, it's often there, it's not, not necessarily all the time, but maybe that just needs cleaning and needs to have, have gates from it to have that connecting face. Uh, that's maybe an opportunity. So sometimes actually we have too, mu too much boundaries, but, but sometimes maybe some boundaries would help, I don't know. This is Clape on the state in West London, um, and um, it's near where I live. And actually, I've never really, they have an amazing big green area around them, but um, I rarely see or never seen any uh, community uh, activities uh, on these. So what if we fenced a little bit area around for the, for the block itself, so they would have like a private shared uh, garden and, and we gave them a barbecue. Would communities start to use it and, and uh, start forming some, some kind of uh, uh, um, communities? Um, and could we try maybe converting like some of, some of the apartments into community rooms in high rises? Or maybe we could concentrate on new developments where um, in the UK government has a target of 200,000 homes each year in England. So what is if those homes would be designed with connectedness in mind? 
As an example, I've got the eighth house for you, which is near Copenhagen, and the, the name comes from its shape. Uh, designers put an enclosed uh, garden, shared garden in the middle. Uh, they lowered that corner so the sunshine can get all the way through, through to the garden and uh, to the apartments, and the apartments would have a nice view as well. What's particularly nice about this setup is that, that you see this ramp. So that it's all rammed around, and uh, uh, on that ramp, actually, you can, you can cycle up to your apartment, and there's like small private uh, gardens too. So they designed this path uh, where you go to your home to connect people as much as possible. So you're quite likely to, to meet your neighbors. Could we change something in schools uh, with regards to architecture to, to make them more connected? This uh, school is the Fuji um, um, kindergarten just outside Tokyo. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful one. It has no boundaries. Kids can leave the classroom whenever they want to. And uh, there's a circular rooftop which, um, um, which is used as a playground. Kids can run around endlessly in loops. Uh, and they do actually, so they, they run more than in usual setups. What's, what's particularly fascinating to me uh, in this project is this. Designers plan for some deliberate risks, like climbing trees, bumping heads, and what they notice is that kids in risks, they start to help each other more, and they start to care for each other much more. So maybe it should be relaxed, the, our obsession for health and safety in schools and consider like what we lose and try to find a be better balance. Or, could we try like just keeping the schoolyard open after, after pickup time? Because people already start uh, talking to each other, kids can play. So uh, we could see like how many new connections and could, could be formed by just doing that. It's an easy one to try. So how can you, how, how do you know that if those ideas are successful or just not gonna work? Unfortunately, today we, we lack uh, measured data on the happiness and connectedness on, on our neighborhoods. Some, some happiness kind of map I found, but that was for boroughs, not like fine-tuned enough or not uh, detailed enough. I think a map of uh, happiness and connectedness could, could really help us drive uh, improvements step by step. And this map is something that I would really love to work on in the years to come. And what kind of data could we collect? There's um, questionnaires actually from uh, positive psychology where they can measure happiness as, as almost like same accuracy, like uh, drug uh, uh, trials. Or we could just simply ask like, how many close friends do you have? Or how many neighbors do you know by name? Uh, you could ask them about their life balance um, and the quality, uh, free time, how much they have. You could also kind of measure how many enterprises started in, connect, in those connected neighborhoods because it's normally higher. Uh, how much they use their community areas, the rooms available. And maybe you could use voice recognition to measure how much kids laugh outside. So just finally a few words about changing mindset because that's a very important part of the puzzle like when it comes to how can we adopt those those findings. Um, as you can see, architecture does offer some, some effective solutions, but it's not going to work without, without changed mindset. So Nordic countries, I think we can, we can learn a lot from. They, they value their happiness more than their financial status. They value their experiences over stuff. They are not obsessed with school achievements or tests. Um, instead, they insist on a good uh, life and work balance. They are also connected to, more to nature. We can also learn, I think, from Costa Rica. It's an uh, interesting example. What a country is doing extremely well on happiness um, compared to how much, like, and, and they are on a friction of money. They, and they use much less resources for that happiness uh, than we do. And what they did at Costa Rica um, uh, ditched their army, their military, uh, in in 1948, 70 years ago, and they pumped all the money into education and environment protection. So what can we win if we can, if we can make our urban spaces happier? And I'm sure that we can. 
happy societies which translate to better health and uh, people staying active for much longer. And it also will lower um, crime rates too. I, I guess we have a long way to go, but shall we start like thinking slightly differently about our neighbors? Shall we be just more friendly with them? Or shall we just organize like a summer party on the green? And that's actually where I think I conclude this presentation. And I, I hope in a few years, I really hope I, I can show you the map of happiness in London. Um, and I can give you much like wider range of uh, examples of connecting spaces. So that's what it is. And until then, watch this space and be part of it. Thank you very much. Do you think attitudes have changed over time? Because um, I'm not that old, but when I was growing up, it wasn't really like that. I lived uh, in a cul-de-sac. Uh, everybody had cars, but they didn't drive them up and down too fast. The kids played out in the street all the time. Um, I remember when I was six, I walked about a mile to school on my own. Um, and, but I mean, we didn't let our children do that, and I'm sure most other people don't anymore. So, uh, if I've heard that uh, figures for abductions and kidnappings and things like that aren't really any different now to what they were 30, 40 years ago. So, why have attitudes changed? Yeah, there's definitely, and uh, yeah, we don't have any more pedophiles than they were in the 70s, and we've got much better kind of technology to, to find them. So, yeah, there's definitely like. I think it's, it's, again, this obsession with health and safety, I think, that's definitely in the way. I don't know, like, about cars, because we also kind of had cars around us, and that wasn't, but I don't know if they were driving uh, at that speed, if, if we probably had much less cars, though, I don't know. Um, but it definitely, like most people name that, that's why they wouldn't let their kids out. So uh, it's, pro it's, it's an attitude problem as well as reality, I guess. I don't know. Anyone? What do you think? <laughs> Whether you use tax incentives or whatever else to bring the construction companies around to it, assuming they don't fail in PFI, etc. Um, this last aspect is the issue. You've got a society that's bred one way. We've spent two, three generations indoctrinating them, whether it's through media, whether it's through social interaction or lack of, it's through the fragmentation of community as it was, you know, the way that industry has changed. Industry used to drive the communities together because you had things like mining co communities and all that kind of thing, and now you don't have that. The migratory aspect of, way of modern life is different. The transient nature of modern life is also there. Lots more people rent rather than stay, stay static. And even when they used to rent, they used to rent for long periods of time and you had lots more social housing. So you can't rely on your communities being relatively permanent because people move away, their lives evolve, they go and do things, they go on holiday to Thailand and then they stay, whatever it is that they do. So you have a major issue here, certainly in these, these modern societies, UK, US, some of you know some of some of what's happening in the in central in, in Europe as well. So it's it's a massive mind shift. If you start to if you start to reeducate the kids now, you might get there within two three generations. I mean, your example there of the Japanese school, um, the space works fine, but you have to look at the way that the kids themselves are brought up. The kids are collaborative within the school across all the age groups throughout all the classes. They communally clean the schools that kind of thing. They have, they're instilled with pride, respect, responsibility, right from the get-go, which is not something that we do here. Yeah, so it, it was two, two, two aspects. Uh, one is definitely, it's, it's, you can't just solve it by architects, of course, like we need to kind of rethink our education and there's definitely like, I can see there was a massive shift and probably people who didn't kind of grew up in community uh, it's probably harder to, and for us as well, to relearn re some basic things like not concentrate on money but concentrate on experience. It's a bit of a relearning. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, 
but I also kind of observed that when you provide that kind of set of space, then it just organically starts happening when it's, it's available. And uh, also this uh, second part, what you said, that people come and go. And that's like, yeah, since I moved to London, that was 14 years ago, I lost quite a few friends who went back to Australia, Canada, and that was quite bad. But what is different when you, you are in co-housing, and, and that would happen as well. But you, you're connected us on a higher level, so m some people might move, but you still have a lot of people around you, you know? So it's, <sighs> it still hurts. But I think it's if, if, if your connections are stronger and, and, and varied, then, then I think it's just a little bit easier to, to handle. But it's, it's definitely, it's, it's not going to solve people coming and moving. Although, I do believe that if you have somewhere where you really like to live, you are less likely to move, you know? Because uh, no wonder people move from rent to rent, because look at, look at, you know, the conditions, how landlords treat their people, you know, look at all the mold on the walls, of course they move. But if you have like a nice uh, setup where you are much connected, then you are less likely to leave your friends behind as well. So that's where I can say to that, but of, of course it's not going to stop it. But any other? Mm. Hi, um, my name is Matthew. Thank you. That was really interesting. Um, just quickly wanted to say a couple of things that, that I've noticed that might be relevant um, or maybe interesting to you. There's one town that we've both been to in the UK that has an interesting architectural feature as far as I was concerned, which is um, it's called Romsey. It's near Southampton. And it, th in a number of areas, what they have, instead of having a street of houses where... Um, the houses face each other across the street, they flipped it sort of 90 degrees. So the houses, the street is off to one side and the houses face each other through their gardens. And I've always wondered whether that was done as a sort of conscious thing because it seems there's a few areas there that old and new that have been built like that, but I've never seen it anywhere else. And, I, and it does seem a lot more pleasant, you know, because there aren't cars going all around where you would like to be out enjoying your garden or whatever. Um, and the other thing is, you just mentioned about renting. Um, I happened to read an article earlier this week about big companies that are building flats to try and, well, make money, but also to try and encourage people to be happier when they're renting and they might be moving from place to place. They, um, they've made a lot more sort of shared spaces and um, there's one a block that had like a shared kitchen that you could use if you wanted to um, and it had a big dining room and things that you could book and they have like a lot of clubs and things to join so I wondered if that might be a trend that um, picks up and, and helps improve oh, happiness. Oh yeah I've heard like uh, actually on uh, Westminster Uni I, I heard that um, uh, someone was doing a, a research on co-living it's a slightly different thing so you ha as you said, like in that setup, you would have like one big kitchen and dining area, and like more like rooms, like, and uh, that's yeah, co-living. Um, I don't know what the, the the outcomes of the research, but, but definitely there's, uh, we know like, wide range of people who who would enjoy <laughs> living in that setup in London, uh, with the sharing like. It was optional though, so like you could have a your own flat, but if you wanted to, you could, I mean, some of, they're going to be different, but the one I was looking at was, it was optional, but it was, they were saying it was very popular that people would spend time together, even though they just, they don't necessarily know each other when they move in. Thank you. And did you find that first example when they kind of changed the street layout, that it was more connecting? Did you see like any evidence? I, I didn't live there. But, um, well, yeah, he's talking about where I, where I, where my parents' place, basically, where I, where I lived, and yeah, basically, you had six houses with a path in the middle, and the houses faced each other, with a, the gardens faced each other, and a path in the middle, and, and basically, yeah, I knew all the neighbours, and you know, different neighbours moved in and out, and I saw that they had kids and stuff, and I went and talked to them, and yeah, it was. It, if I imagine if the houses did face straight onto the road, I wouldn't have talk to anyone 
it's quite possible. It Thank works. you, I might actually <laughs> yeah. take that example. Uh, you've got lots of different examples of um, of sort of co-living spaces, but do you think there's an uh, ideal size? So we talked about an example of kind of six houses facing each other, and then the figure of eight building looked looked absolutely massive. Do you think there's a size that some sizes that work better than others? Uh, it's not co-living; it's co-housing. Co-living, is, yeah. It's, it's like, um, this. So what uh, Denmark did? They did a trial and failure approach. And what they found that actually they started to look for what worked for them over time that for example the houses they made them smaller and then the areas got bigger that's one thing they learned uh, but it changes from country to country so for example for Norway there are smaller ones so there's normally 10 houses in a cluster uh, I think both of them works and, 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 and have some different uh, slightly different you know if you have for example um, 40, uh, 40, 50 houses together. Then you can have things like a jacuzzi, a gym. You can you can have like a defibrillator. You know, you can you can have all different kind of added service, a carpool. But seriously, so there's one advantage of going bigger. But both of them works perfectly. Like you know, Selena with the ten houses works quite nicely. I really like our houses where you also integrate the elderly people and they can meet the young generation. I, I think that's beautiful because they, they, they really kind of have, uh, have a lot more going, you know. Kids learn so much from elderly people and elderly people shouldn't really, you know, have, have their days lonely as well. So any, any size can work and it's from culture to culture, even actually there's differences between between countries like what there's plenty of examples actually there's a database uh, of, of all the co-housing there's books there's the UK co-housing network uh, with plenty uh, of information uh, measurements I haven't come across too much uh, mostly like case studies and anecdotal unfortunately but I hope that will change